Um, so um, this is a recap of the advanced course in diagnostics for LSHTM. We have a really excellent um, group of folks who have agreed to give sort of brief synopses. Um, just to give you a little bit of an overview of the advanced course, this course is focused on diagnostics in all its shapes and sizes. How can we expand diagnostics? What's the rationale? How can we build stronger lab systems um, with a focus on in, in um, low and middle income countries? And um, we really, we've, we're delighted um, to have um, Benedict Poncier from the Mario Foundation. Benedict is gonna give a brief introduction to the Mario Foundation goals for the course. Um, so without further ado, over to you, Benedict. Okay, uh, thanks everyone. Uh, let me open the presentation. Sorry. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Yes, coming now. Okay. Uh, so, hi everyone, I'm Benedict Parcier and I'm the director of Les Pensières, Center for Global Health. And every year we have the pleasure and the honor to, to host the advanced course on diagnostics. This was the 12th edition uh, in September. And I work closely with Sandra Angel, who is the international course project manager. So, we are making this presentation together. And actually, I'm going to present this slide, and uh, Sandra will present the results of the evaluation afterwards. So, we just wanted to, to share the objectives of the course for the Merieu Foundation. But first of all, we wanted to give a quick overview of the Merieu Foundation. Maybe for those who are not uh, that familiar with um, our foundation. So the foundation was created in uh, 1967 by Dr. Charles Merieu in memory of his father, Marcel Merieu, who was a student of Louis Pasteur. And uh, you know, this picture on the screen was taken in uh, 1894, so in the 19th century. Uh, and you have Louis Pasteur in the middle, Marcel Merieu, and all his students at the time. And um, it was really important. All the, the Mario industry during the 20th century was focused on uh, vaccines. Um, the, the group is no longer in the vaccine industry. It's now in the diagnostics. But it, it was important for Charles Merieu, you know, to give back to the society. And that's the reason why, you know, he decided to create this uh, family foundation in 1967. And the mission of our foundation is really to strengthen local capacities to fight infectious diseases. And what is really uh, key in this uh, mission statement is to strengthen local capacity, because as Joe said, you know, one of the key objectives uh, of the course is to uh, threaten laboratory systems. And you will see how uh, this advanced course on diagnostic can contribute uh, to these objectives. And we are mainly present in low and middle income countries. Uh, so we have uh, four main objectives, and uh, you will see that uh, actually the advanced course on diagnostics meets two of these objectives. So the first one is to increase vulnerable population access to diagnostic to ensure that we uh, have a good surveillance of uh, infectious diseases and we threaten clinical laboratories in national healthcare systems. The second objective is to enhance uh, local applied uh, research capabilities. Uh, and we focus mainly on uh, IMR, on um, tuberculosis, on respiratory diseases, and uh, emerging uh, new viruses. Uh, the third priority, and is also very much aligned with uh, the ACIDIX course, is to encourage knowledge sharing and public health initiatives. And this is uh, in relation with, um, with Les Pensières. And basically, this is the Marius Foundation vision 
um, to, to bring together experts from different countries, different uh, disciplines to advance global health in the world. So this is really the DNA of the Merieux Foundation. It was really in the uh, initial status of, uh, of our foundation. And I will give you uh, some examples later on. And uh, last but not least, one of our objectives is also to improve conditions for mothers and children in a global health approach. So not only providing healthcare, but also making sure that the most vulnerable population have access to good education, to hygiene, um, to also ha have housing and nutrition, good nutrition. So uh, if we go back to the uh, knowledge sharing activities, you have on the screen, um, our, we have uh, four public health topics that are covered by our advanced courses. So as you can see, we have um, four health topics that are vaccinology. Uh, this is covered by the advanced course on the vaccinology. Uh, I will come back to diagnostic. IMR, just took place last week, and then epidemiology. And the first edition took place in March. And on the diagnostic side, we have uh, developed two uh, courses. And these courses are always co-developed with our partners. And uh, for ACDX, we are very pleased you know, to have this long-term uh, partnership with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, so this uh, international course takes place every year. Um, at Les Pensières, and uh, four years ago, we also developed a new one, uh, afro -CDX for francophone uh, African countries. And uh, we're going to host the third edition next week. So just to remind maybe people how it all started, so we created the advanced course of vaccinology 20 years ago with the University of Geneva. And uh, 10 years later, in 2009, um, it was actually the vision of uh, Professor Rosanna Peeling. And uh, I think we all must pay her uh, a tribute for her vision, for her commitment uh, and engagement to make this uh, happen. But it was really Rosanna together with um, uh, so uh, François-Xavier Babin with the support of Alain Merieux. And they had this vision that uh, we should create an advanced course on diagnostics. So it was created in 2009. And uh, the two objectives, main objective, as um, Joe said, is first of all, to advocate for the role and value of diagnostics in global health. Um, and now with the COVID and all the new epidemics, it sounds more, it's more, easy, it's easier, but uh, 10 or 13 years ago, it was not uh, that uh, that obvious. And uh, it was really the, the fight years after year to, to show the, the value of good diagnostics. And the second objective is really to reinforce local capacity, to build local capacity for critical decision-making on diagnostic in developing countries through this partnership and network. So this is also one of the key elements of the advanced course on diagnostic or the, the partnerships and the networks and the alumni networks, but I think we will uh, get back to that. So these are uh, the key topics that are covered and maybe um, Joe or Sandra, you will want to, to expand on this, but these are the, the, the main uh, themes that are covered in the advanced course on diagnostics. Uh, so first of all, the role of diagnostic in the fight against the IMR. This is a critical topic, but also laboratory system strengthening. We also have a session on social and technical innovation. Uh, this year, we had a new session on uh, communication in diagnostic program to make sure you know that uh, the participants are the tools and are well equipped um, to, to better communicate and advocate for the value and the role of diagnostics. And uh, we had also a new topic this year, climate crisis and diagnostic that had a, a huge success. I think that's all for me. And I'm happy to answer any question or maybe at the at the end of, uh, of all the presentation. Thanks, Benedict. Any quick clarifying questions for Benedict before we go on to Sandra? 
No? Okay. Um, there will be time at the end too for questions. Um, so now as, as Benedict mentioned, um, Sandra um, put together a, um, a, uh, a few reflections on the evaluations from this past year's um, ACDX course. Um, so over to you, Sandra. Oops. Um, Thank you, Drew. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Yes. Yes. Okay. We can't okay. see it yet. Yes, uh, it's, see... it's full screen. Are you? Sh it's sharing. Yes, I think so. I will do it again. Um. Ah. Yes, it's coming. Yeah. It's yeah. Coming. Okay. Sorry. Can you see it in full screen? It's in. It's not in the full screen mode. Um, I think you need to go to the bottom right. Sorry. It's okay. It's okay, and I want it to. Um. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you, Joe, and uh, hello, everyone. So, uh, um, I'm an international courses project manager working at the Mayo Foundation since uh, 2018, and in charge of several courses, including uh, a course uh, in uh, in uh, epidemiology also. Um, oh, my connection is not so good. I hope it will be fine. I'd like to share in a, in full screen it would be better. But uh, can you see the slide correctly? Yes, but it would be better if you could be in full screen. At the bottom there is a red light. Yes, there. Yeah, but when I try to do that, you it, can you see it in full screen or not? Go back to the view you are on. Is it is it okay? Can you see it correctly? If if you go to full screen, but I'm in full screen. <laughs> Probably you are with two screens, two no, computers. Press F five or press the start screen. Yeah. Show you. So let me. Is it in full screen now? Yes. Perfect. Yes. That's great. Okay. okay. So, sorry, this technical issue. So, um, I said by um, Benedict, in fact, we have um, uh, the course is the uh, last uh, six days, and uh, it includes uh, six different sessions. So, the first one is dedicated to the value of diagnostic, and this year we open this the course with uh, uh, the WHA World Health Assembly Resolution on Diagnostics, which has been uh, approved on uh, last May. And it was the first uh, resolution on diagnostics, so very important event. So we really wanted to, 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 to focus on that, especially at the beginning of the course. Um, then the second session um, was related to uh, uh, the lesson learned post-COVID-19 epidemic um, outbreak and uh, to, to review some infectious disease with epidemic potential and also to better understand the barriers faced by a diagnostic test developer and policymakers to uh, to be better prepared to, to, to fight epidemic uh, outbreaks. Sorry. Um, the third session uh, was related to um, 
the key uh, elements uh, for laboratory system strengthening to improve access to diagnostics. So we reviewed the importance of uh, three key, key elements uh, uh, which has to be uh, taken into account to, to have a good laboratory and a laboratory given a, a diagnostic of quality. Uh, including quality management, biosafety, biosecurity training, and also uh, laboratory, how we can perform laboratory performance assessments, and the importance of diagnostic network optimization, so the general aspect. Um, on Wednesday, we, we had a focus on, on uh, this is the innovation day. So uh, we uh, speak about uh, uh, technical innovation and social innovation. So uh, what are the new trends in diagnostics and uh, the uh, concept of uh, social innovation, which is also most of the, of the time uh, a, a new concept for the participants. Then we have a session dedicated to uh, the importance of diagnostic to fight uh, antimicrobial resistance. And the same, how we can uh, uh, leverage barriers uh, to, to, to ease uh, access to diagnostic and what are, what are the barriers faced by diagnostic test developer and policy maker again, again to fight IMR. And the last session is related to the laboratory system sustainability and importance to have partnership and network uh, to, uh, to system uh, to, to, to have a, to sustain laboratory systems. And we, we, of course, end the course to uh, reviewing the, the strengths and weaknesses of the, of the course. So participants have been asked to uh, evaluate each of these sessions at the end of each day. Uh, then we ask them to, have a, to, to perform a global evaluation of the course. Uh, this is uh, really important for, uh, for us to, to know the impact, the potential impact of the course, but also uh, to, to get the uh, suggestion of improvement and the take home messages. Um, and um, uh, really, the evaluation are essential. We insist every year saying that the evaluation are essential for us to improve continuously the course in terms of structure, content and uh, also to guarantee uh, its uh, excellence. So here are the main results we got this year coming from the participants. So for each session, so we we had three common question. Um, so this is uh, the summary of the six, uh, the answer given for the six session. The first common question was, were the presentation roundtable discussion relevant to the topic? And you can see that, um, 99% uh, of the answer of the, the people answering estimated that uh, the, the presentation were relevant or very relevant to the topic. The second common question was on the quality of the presentation, roundtable and discussion. Uh, did they meet the expectations? So yes, absolutely. They meet the expectation of the participants in uh, uh, 96 percent of the case. Um, and the third la common question was on the course material, quality of the course material. Uh, was it useful? So yes, after 97 percent. So uh, evaluation was, the rating of years evaluation was very good. Then we ask um, also every day um, the participants to, to rate each uh, speakers. Uh, in terms of uh, presentation, teaching, considering the style, the tone, and the slide they presented. So you can see that on an average of uh, 25 lecturers, we had a very good rating. Uh, most of them were rated as good or excellent. Um, then at the end of the course, so we had a, we had a general evaluation, and we asked to the participant if the course met the expectations. So Yes, very much. Uh, would you say the course format was appropriate in terms of choice of the topic, content of the presentation, opportunity of networking? And yes, in all of the cases. And this is really, really important to emphasize uh, that uh, the opportunity of networking is one of the main goals of the course. Uh, not only the content, but really to spend one week together 
uh, with all the participants and all the all the faculty uh, coming there, staying uh, several days. Uh, it's a really uh, very good opportunity to uh, to exchange and to have uh, to to make some. Uh, uh, collaboration and to have uh, uh, this opportunity to speak with the expert of diagnostic is really unique uh, during this course. We ask them if the course contributes to increasing their knowledge. So yes, absolutely. And uh, to what extent the participation of the course will impact the current activity? And it seems that in most of the, uh, for most of them, uh, the course uh, will have a, an impact on their current activity. So it would be interesting to have a, a, another um, survey in six months to see uh, what are really the impact concretely, uh, what, are, what was the impact of the course on the activity, just to, 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 for us also to, to be able to measure the impact. So regarding the suggestion improvement from the students, some examples. So they uh, suggested to have a more one earth approach, uh, to have a link between uh, human diagnostic with animal and, agri and uh, environmental diagnostics, uh, to have some other perspective from China, um, perspective that's true that we, we give, a, we have an approach based on the LMIC um, uh, experience. And uh, this year they, they asked us to, to have a, some other view, and especially coming from uh, from Asia, uh, to hear more about what digital health strategy are and advances being made in connected diagnostics. So this is a really important topic. Sorry, um, because we have new uh, new uh, diagnostic uh, connected diagnostic, and it is really important to have a uh, connection between data and to have data of quality. Uh, to be able to analyze all this data, so the, the connection is uh, is key. Um, they requested more time for some exercises, and this is all very often the case. We uh, and uh, we they suggested to limit the number of talks to have more time for discussion. So this is always an issue of balance between the content we have to provide and time to discussion uh, to allow participants to discuss between them. Between them and to take the to give the uh, the point of view on different topics. The the main take home messages uh, are listed there. So um, they uh, realize that uh, we we made some progress post COVID nineteen pandemic, but uh, there are still some uh, uh, some uh, Difference of access in diagnostic, depending on the country. This is this is absolutely true. Um, diagnostic plays a central role in global health, and uh, the WHA resolution is really important to secure access to diagnostic tools in different countries. Um, they noticed that diagnosing 90% of the population in key in six key conditions would have saved 1.1 million lives globally. So this is a um, uh, a statement uh, given by Susan Norton from Lancet uh, um, uh, Commission. Uh, also, they uh, highlighted the importance of regulatory, uh, local manufacturing, implementation of bio, bio bank, impact of climate crisis in diagnostics, innovative diagnostics, um, and for, also for early detection and control of emerging disease. Uh, quality management system, diagnostic network optimization, and so on. So I don't want to be uh, too long, but uh, uh, all these topics are really uh, uh, important. And uh, also social innovation. And I said previously, this is, a, uh, this is important because it engages the community. And this is a, sometimes a new, uh, new topic for the participants and also the importance of diagnostic detecting IML and uh, the role of the communication. It, it was a new uh, topic this year, communication in a diagnostic program, how we can better communicate. And, uh, and they uh, finally said, uh, we are the information ambassador, key opinion leaders, and we have to play our role. So then guys, communication is important. So some, picture just to show you uh, 
where the post uh, was organized and parents room with some we had some round table some group exercise of course um, and uh, all at the end of the course all the participants uh, uh, received um, a, a diploma a certificate of participation and uh, thank you very much for, for your attention Thanks, Sandra. That was great. Really excellent overview and you've set the stage for us. So now we're going to go into deeper dives and next we're going to hear from Carlos Gouve. He's going to talk to us about post-COVID-19 epidemic preparedness and diagnostics. Over to you, Carlos. Thanks a lot, Joe. It's a pleasure to be here with all the colleagues. It's always good to be virtual or in presence, which is even better. But anyway, what I would like to, to indicate is really the importance of the topics we have discussed. Uh, in the case of our session on Monday, 18th of September, we could go over a lot of uh, the preparedness work for new epidemics that could come. And of course, the example of COVID was the main topic. So we brought a little bit of the what was happening in what is happening in Latin America in Africa and also find trolls uh, brought a little bit of their, uh, let's say, recent updates in terms of uh, focus for low median income countries, not only uh, Africa, but also they have been investing a lot of time now in, in Latin America as well. So we brought as one of the round tables, very rich about past development counting on people from regulatory bodies, uh, ministries of health, uh, CDC, Institut Pasteur, several from London School as well. Finally, a little bit about building capacity, so how we could actually focus on key topics like network of biobanks, how would be actually uh, an essential part of a biobank, even regulation for that, and uh, how we could actually source from raw materials whenever necessary. Finally, uh, after lunch, we got the regulatory developments in diagnostics. So a very rich discussion about bottlenecks and future developments. And finally, going a little bit on, on exercises. Anyway, I, I don't have a, rep a presentation here, but I would really like to emphasize uh, the importance of an event like our ACDX. I have been taking part in most of the events since the beginning, and it's really uh, a fantastic opportunity for us to exchange experience, to really go over key points and bottlenecks and hurdles that we have in our daily life, but especially to plan together how we can change that situation. In the case of Latin America, we have been blessed with so many opportunities. Uh, after uh, the first ACDX, we we were able, following a suggestion by Rosanna, to create an alliance that actually is Aladif. And that organization, a not-for-profit, has been getting together academics, industry, and governments really to discuss how we can actually bring products earlier than normal without so many barriers and difficulties. And uh, as a consequence, we have been able to count on people from Ministry of Health and Visa, and also regulators and government agents from different countries in the continent, really to discuss convergence in a wider scope. So we created a coalition, an inter-America coalition for regulatory convergence. We were able to get funds from for Aladif, but also for this coalition from different bodies, from CDC, from Gates, uh, great, great challenges from Canada. Rosanna was able through London School, but we got also from USAID. So several different works started from there. And countries nowadays discuss on a wider way how to really take advantage of what is already there. So reliance is something we discuss on a normal basis. I was, as a matter of fact, in a meeting now with Avisa and other institutions 
discussing the use of reliance for registration purposes. So how can we already count on some uh, stringent regulatory bodies for expediting the regular the registration process? And the same we're doing within the IMDRF, we can do with the other regulatory bodies in the continent that can use, for instance, a visas uh, structure and decisions. That's a very powerful thing. Another is also to discuss uh, points like ethics and integrity. That was something that in the past it was not in our scope, but without a proper and reliable and fair trade environment, we cannot really advance. We will lose in terms of uh, competitiveness. Uh, we will not get as much investment as needed and uh, products will not reach the patient at the end. So it's something really important. And in the case, we have even been part of APAC uh, discussions on how we can have a consensus framework. So a uh, common ground for ethics and integrity. Uh, another outcome of our ACDX is really to discuss expansion of new testing facilities. So as a, one of the consequences is that we have nowadays, at least in Brazil, the possibility to have, for instance, pharmacies and drug stores and doctor's offices as a, a place for testing, rapid testing and point of care. Uh, Patricia Garcia brought one ex one time an example of Avon girls that go door to door to be also a kind of tool for new testing possibilities for rapid test or point of care, especially the rapid test, at least for screening purposes. So to conclude, I think we can also use this kind of discussion like we did really to be better prepared for future uh, future situations like epidemics, pandemics, but some are already here, so like AMR. So with the support of London School and IDC, the International Diagnostic Center, some projects like Observatory for Diagnostics is going to focus as a kind of pilot uh, project for AMR initiatives to detect where the product, in the case diagnostic, is being deployed for for detection, identification, and sequencing, eventually for susceptibility for antibiotic. So these are some of the things and uh, the new opportunities for uh, production. It has to be new kinds of organizations of production has to be on the topic also for discussion. Uh, some countries have been discussing localization or regionalizations, which means that we have to be part of global chains of development and production. What is going to be our role? It has to be very well discussed, but we have to find ourselves in this new production chains because that's the way we can face a new, let's say, logistic problems in the future and uh, be wise enough to turn the key and have our own way to get supply of key products. So in a nutshell, Joe, these are the points that I would like to bring. It's not only that we had a fantastic session on that day, session two, but there are many uh, lessons that we can take home and try to develop meanwhile until we have the next, uh, next event and try to really take use and advantage of this network for sharing experiences, sharing doubts, helping each other. But that's because that's the powerful value we create with this. That's my notes, my observations. Thank you, Carlos. That was great. Um, and we're going to hear next from Dr. Noah Fangwan about laboratory system strengthening. Over to you, Noah.
Hi, Joe. Sorry. Uh, please, can we skip to the next one so that let me finish what I'm doing right now? Sure. No worries. Um, Sorry. We'll go to Dr. Anae Pakri. She'll tell us about innovations in diagnostics. Anae? Thanks. Looks good. Over to you. Sorry, thanks, Joe. Struggled a bit to unmute myself. Hi, everyone. So I'll take the next few minutes to talk about the session on the 20th, which was looking at innovative approaches for diagnostics. So we had three invited talks, and um, first on the list, we heard from Dr. Iwelumo, who spoke about her access project. Um, which was focused on social innovations for HPV diagnostics. The aim of the project was to identify community-led innovative strategies to sort of scale up HPV vaccination and screening for girls and women in Nigeria. She described the process as a multi-stage and project that started with a crowdsourcing open call for community-led innovative ideas that could help enhance HPV screening and vaccination. The open calls were reviewed and a set were invited for a three-day intensive design at on where the teams made their pitches and the top teams were then selected to go through a four-week intensive boot camp where they received intensive capacity building and training towards implementing and piloting these diagnostic innovations in real settings. Currently, I think some of the teams have started their pilot projects across um, different states in the country. Secondly, we heard from Dr. Atara Siha from Gavi, who spoke to us about their innovations in diagnostics with um, yellow fever that has seen huge success and was sort of um, scaled up to other diseases. So the main um, catch for this um, innovative diagnostic was to reduce time to actual diagnosis. And in December of 2021, the Gavi Bond received funding to sort of scale this up. The aim was to improve availability for fit for purpose diagnostics tools. So from the success with yellow fever, they sort of expanded to tests for cholera, measles, meningococcus, rubella, and typhoid. And some of the achievements has been to improve efficiency, effectiveness, and equity of vaccine support, and also help to address some of the market failures that have been pre-identified in diagnostics. Our third talk on the session of um, innovations for diagnostics was from Dr. Javier from the Savix group. Here they are big on data and digital tech. So he shared their innovations, had data to care. And the catch here is really connecting diagnostics for real-time data um, sharing. So what they did is collect um, or capture laboratory data on laboratory equipment. This has been rolled out in 26 different tests across 12 diseases. And what they do is transfer the data immediately for the patient's results and patient's information onto a national server. And this is done via internet. But not to worry, in areas where there's poor internet coverage or no internet at all, the data can also be shared via SMS. And this helps both the patient, the prescriber, the caregiver to access the patient's results and the patient's information real time. So the catch here or the impact has been faster access to treatment and reduced contamination within the community. Obviously, if you're able to catch and treat the disease, then it reduces the spread within communities. So I think this wraps some of the talks. And then we had a round table on inognitic diagnostic development. We had six excellent panelists from different um, sectors across regulations, policies, industry. We had um, someone talk about logistics in vitro, and then obviously leveraging digital tests. And some of the key issues when thinking about rollout of innovative new tests, especially in LMICs, 
were discussed in full length. The take home point is that in developing these diagnostic texts, LMICs will have, um, in LMICs, there will be several implications and these borders around regulations, logistics, costs, and other operational aspects. At this point, there's need for careful thoughts and planning at each stage to ensure effective and impactful rollout. I'll close the session with our social innovation participatory activities where we had participants split into groups. We introduced them to the concept of social innovation using a short um, social innovation video. Once the concept was um, achieved, we split the participants into small groups and then we had rules. We had them come up with a problem or identify a problem and then describe their innovation in diagnostics to address that problem. Two key things they were to highlight was how they would engage the local community in implementing this innovation in diagnostics and what partnerships will be needed to sustain this diagnostic innovation in the long term. And they were given two minutes to feedback to the entire group. Here you could see some of our participants feeding back their social innovation diagnostic concepts we had from another group. And this was a snapshot working in the um, participatory session. And some of the highlights of the social innovations that came out from this um, group activity was innovative diagnostic texts targeted at malaria in pregnant women, and then advancing in innovative diagnostics for TB in LMICs. I'll stop here, but I'd like to leave you with some very excited and highly motivated diagnostic innovators. Thank you. Thanks, Anae. That was a nice, very nice overview of the Innovation Day. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Emma Harding-Ash, and she's now in Tanzania and um, doesn't have a great um, internet connection, but has very kindly organized a pre-recording and so um, we'll share that. And I think she may be available for questions afterwards if folks have questions, but um, you can go ahead and start the, thanks. Hello, I'm Emma Harding-Esch, based at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Sorry not to be able to give the presentation in person today. I'm talking about the diagnostics for AMR session of the course, which was held on Thursday, the 21st of September. So this is the outline of the session on diagnostics for AMR. Uh, we had two talks on the importance of diagnostics in the global AMR response, two talks on point of care diagnostics for the detection of AMR, and then a round table where we discuss challenges and lessons learned from implementation of a laboratory based surveillance system for antibiotic resistance. And I've pulled out a few key themes that came out from this session for you today. First, I want to talk about interconnectedness and integration. So when Sylvia from the World Health Organization was talking about lab strengthening, she highlighted the need for laboratories across the health system that are interconnected. She provided an example of an integrated tier system for bacterial laboratory networks which are well established for surveillance and are useful for expanding labs for HIV and TB. However, she noted there is no great network for laboratories for clinical diagnosis. One Health, by its very nature, is about the interconnectedness of humans, animals and the environment. And Francesca from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations explained how integration and surveillance is essential for AMR control, with an example from the Canadian Integrated Programme for AMR Surveillance, showing that integrated surveillance is possible. So Francesca talked a lot about surveillance, and I really liked this slide showing the journey of antimicrobial resistance data. Francesca concluded that there needs to be more emphasis on improving the quality of AMR data for guiding therapeutic treatments in humans, animals, and plant or crop health practices and for surveillance purposes. 
When speaking about the mapping antimicrobial resistance and antimicrobial use partnership, Sylvia highlighted the lack of AMR data in Africa. With 88% of samples tested not including the patient's clinical profile and the remaining 12% being incomplete. So this means that the data informing modeling work is of poor quality and is biased. And so then these need to be interpreted with caution. So basically we need quality AMR data for action. With regards to the point of care tests, both Sergio from FIND and I showed how point of care tests could be implemented into clinical care and change antibiotic prescribing and improve antibiotic stewardship. In my presentation on cost effectiveness of point of care tests for gonorrhea AMR, I showed that point of care tests can lead to better antibiotic choices, can decrease the emergence of AMR in the future and be cost effectiveness. Sergio highlighted, however, that depending on use, so for example, surveillance versus clinical care, the requirements of the test are different. So we talk a lot about implementation and I'm just going to highlight a couple of the points here. With regards to lab strengthening, Sylvia noted that the WHO essential diagnostics list doesn't provide granularity of placement of tests across the health system which is something that the AMR Diagnostic Initiative is aiming to achieve. Several of us talked about the need for innovation and research to inform evidence-based practice. And I think, think this slide from Sergio summarizes beautifully that the needs are different in different settings. If we could have different tests for different use cases, perhaps the trade-offs in test characteristics could be avoided. A particular highlight for me was finding out about different initiatives, programs and resources available, a few of which I've listed here to give you an idea. But I think my best highlight was meeting this incredible group of people. The course was designed to give us lots of opportunities to speak with each other and work together. And I learned so much and also had a lot of fun. It was truly a brilliant week and it was an honour to be part of it. Thanks, Emma. That was great. Um, and I completely agree. It was a really exceptional group of um, diagnostics researchers and leaders, laboratory scientists, um, private sector folks. And um, it was really a productive and rich meeting. Um, I wanted to take a few minutes at the end and give an opportunity for Professor Rosanna Peeling, who, um, as we mentioned before, founded the course. She did not join this 2023 course. So she is an independent sort of, um, she's looking at this with fresh eyes, but we were very keen to, to get your reflections, um, Rosanna, and to hear back about um, directions and um, uh, what, what your thoughts are. So um, over to you, Rosanna. Hi, Joe. <laughs> Thank you for asking me to, give a few minutes of reflection on this. Uh, hi, everyone. It's nice to see you all. Um, I had a family commitment for a reunion in Asia and uh, had to miss the course. And uh, But during that week, I was constantly thinking about you guys and what you were doing. <laughs> because the course is not only about teaching, about sharing, but also all the social interactions um, that uh, everyone enjoys so much. And so um, so I, I'm so glad to see that, um, you know, the, the new uh, initiatives that we need to be engaging, um, you're taking on already, like digital health, communications, which is something that we always said that, um, you know, diagnostics is undervalued, et cetera. And, and I was told when I was in Health Canada that scientists make the worst people for advocation <laughs> of a, a course because we always qualify what we say with, oh, but, you know, there are false positives, false negatives, and all that. And so um, 
being able to communicate the importance of diagnostics is a really key um, thing for all um, policymakers, et cetera, who are trying to convince governments to invest in diagnostics. So congratulations, uh, Joe and, and Sandra and, and uh, uh, all of you for actually starting to think about communications uh, as a, a big part of it. And, and I think digital health uh, regulatory, we, we had been doing regulatory, you know, trying to meet the challenges of regulation of diagnostics for a long time. And, um, and I think we're making um, some progress, but we need to be working more on it. Uh, the pandemic has shown us how important that is. Yeah. So, um, and, and of course, AMR is a huge topic. Um, and, uh, and there are so many aspects of AMR that uh, needs uh, tackling. And, and so I'm so glad that you devoted the whole day uh, to it. Um, uh, and, and I think, you know, Joe, you're, you're doing a great job, Sandra. Um, you know, I have, I, I have no doubt that uh, the course will continue to go from strength to strength. So congratulations. Thank you. Thanks, Rosanna. Um, we do have a few minutes for questions here at the end. And I guess um, Rosanna nicely brought up several areas that are important. Um, the other parts that were sort of different this year, we, we did a very small 90-minute um, workshop on climate crisis and diagnostics. And it ended up being one of the things that participants absolutely loved. They we we actually had a follow up breakfast meeting. Several of the participants crafted a commentary that um, and and a few of those folks are on the line now. But one of the things that Carlos brought up, which I think is really important, is how does ACDX lead to publications, to um, new research grants, and I think the climate crisis is a good example of um, several folks came up afterwards and said, you know what, there's a bigger intersection here between climate and diagnostics than we had thought, and we really need to think more carefully about it. Um, but I, I see on the line, there are a lot of folks who were participants at, at this most recent um, uh, ACDX any other final thoughts in the last few minutes or questions about um, strategic priorities or um, directions that you think we should um, focus on more moving forward? You can either raise your hand or put um, questions into the chat. There was one question earlier from Michael Marks about SAVIX and um, whether or not the SAVIX was linked to, um, was speaking to DHIS2. Um, I, the SAVIX group was really fascinating just in terms of how they work with local authorities in the DRC in a lot of areas that are that have very limited health infrastructure. So if DHIS2 is being used in the countries where they're working, I would guess that it probably is interoperable, um, but I'm happy to introduce you to the person who spoke or um, link you up with them if that would be helpful, Michael. And sorry, um, Christina, back to you, go ahead. Yeah, Joe, I, I'm glad you brought this up because I think Michael asked a very important question about uh, whether speak, uh, systems talk to each other. And, and really, um, years ago, uh, WHO held a meeting uh, to try to get everyone to have interoperable uh, data systems, but it, it ended up being um, like too much to ask because each diagnostic company already have their own bes bespoke system. Um, and so uh, we, what we were trying to do was to see whether there were some middleware solutions that allow countries to be able to extract data 
um, anonymously from each one of the diagnostic company systems, as well as to be able to talk to systems in finance, uh, within the country systems in other, you know, procurement, etc. But it, it turns out to be such a huge problem that it was very hard to make progress. So I think this is a, a very, very um, important topic for ACDX to tackle over. Thanks, Rosanna. Yeah, I agree with so many different um, bespoke systems. It's um, It can be difficult. And I think the several funders now are thinking more about open access, inter questions of interoperable um, data, yeah. you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, really that's going to be, Joe, a little bit of what we're going to try to do here in Brazil. So it can be a kind of pilot for, for this big venture. I have already agreement from some labs, key labs, some public and private, but also some of our industry members should take part with that in collaborating. So we can probably get this as a kind of example, how to retrieve this data, how to treat them, because in mm -hmm. some cases they are going to be doubling uh, the same information. So how we can clean and then mm -hmm. how we can report this. Uh, following, of course, all the legal constraints of uh, confidentiality yeah. and so on. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I realize we're right at the hour and many of you need to go. Um, I'd like to thank again our um, colleagues at the Mario Foundation, Benedict and Sandra. I'd like to thank all of the faculty who joined us and provided really helpful summaries, um, Carlos and Emma and Anae, um, and thanks uh, Dr. Peeling for joining us and we look forward to having you come back, come back to ACDM. We need you. I would love to. <laughs> um, no, I think it's really, we missed you and um, we uh, we want you to come back as soon as possible. <laughs> um, yeah, but this was great. And if, if people do have additional questions or want to chat, um, folks are free to stay on the line. And we are, we did record this. I know there were at least a few people who couldn't make it. Um, we'll share a recording of the um, of the session. And this might also be helpful for, for people who are thinking about applying for the next iteration of the ACDX course in 2024. So um, if, for those who are who either participated or have colleagues out there, we'll do a similar call for applications um, next year and um, details will be posted on social media and on the, on the Mario Foundation website. Um, but I think this is a, a truly important training course and a really unique opportunity. When I was recently in China, there was a, a real interest from a bunch of different groups to, to accelerate diagnostics um, research and programs. So I think a very bright future and excited to um, continue learning with all of you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank Joe, you. Rosanna. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, there is one thing for next year that I would like to suggest before we close. Uh, there was a, a, a defense of thesis this past week from our economist at 